Thank you again and welcome, welcome. And we really do appreciate you being here. And again, as was mentioned, we are, this is our first time having this festival here with the Hopi. And some of you may have been out on Hopi. Can I see the hands of who's been on Hopi? That's good to see. And those of you that have never heard of Hopi, none, yeah, okay, one, two, three. Okay, so that's, that's interesting too. And let me just share a, a quick story with you, which I think is really appropriate for this presentation. I, <clears throat> I met Dr. Viola, who is a consultant to the Smithsonian, and he actually did a, a You'll, you'll see it later, a PowerPoint presentation on the Hopi Code Talkers. So Hopi also had Code Talkers. I know you hear a lot about the Navajo, but Hopi also, they were also Code Talkers. The, the story that uh, Dr. Viola shared with us yesterday, because she was interviewing my daughter regarding Lori Payestiwa, you, you probably heard about her, the first Native American that was uh, obviously not with us now, but it happened in Afghanistan. And she was telling a story about another Native woman that was also actually a, a, an officer in the Army. And they were in, in one of the, I'll call it a village, and the people were coming up to her and they were asking her, who are you and what's your nationality and are you from here because obviously almost the same color, if you will. And she said, no, I'm from, the, I'm from the U.S. and I'm a Native American. Actually, she said, I'm an Indian. She says, oh, you're from India. No, I'm not from India. I'm, from, I'm a Native American from America. I said, oh. And they said, well, we were told that there were no, there were no longer any Native Americans left in the U.S. because they were all killed said, no, there's still a lot of us around. So that, is really, that was really interesting, but I've been in different, in my career, I've worked in different places, and people that I work with, I was working here in D.C., they also kind of asked me the same question, too, about what tribe are you and all that, and I said, wow, really, are they still in existence? I said, yeah, very much so. <laughs> We're still around, so... <laughs> So with that, I wanted to just go into some of the history. And we have a long history, a rich history. Uh, some of it is not very, uh, not really good to talk about, but it's our past and we've learned from it. And what has kept us going is what you see here, the dances, our faith, our practices, our culture. And when I was talking about the dance group and what, they, what we go through, it's because that's what sustains Hopi and the beliefs that we have. So right around 400 BC, Hopi, <clears throat> there was first evidence of cult cultivation of corn, beans, and squash. This was the beginning of a gradual shift from a nomadic or a semi-nomadic lifestyle to a more sedentary evidence of where we, where we live now. So Hobi, they have their migration stories. They came from, we emerged from the Grand Canyon. There's a place called Sipap. That's a very, very spiritual place. And as Hopi, when you're living, the only people that can go there are the, we call them priests, because we don't really have a, a, a direct translation of their, the highest level of initiation. They're the only ones go there to deliver prayer feathers. So the only time that we, t we are told that we can go there is because that's when you pass on, that's the same place you go. So it's emergence and then it's back to the spirit world. So some of you may have heard that story already. So during our journey, <clears throat> we came from different parts uh, and when we first came up, they traveled all over. That's where they were kind of nomadic, trying to find a place to live, settle down. So our stories are told by these pictoglyphs that you see. You'll see a lot of them out in the Southwest, in Colorado, in 
even down as far as Mexico into California and New Mexico. So the gentleman here is um, Zavatawa. He has a booth out front in the Potomac. And he's, a, he's in, his business is tourism. So when you go out to Hopi, you can schedule with him and go on a tour. But there are a lot of pictoglyphs that are out there. And this tells our, our migration story. So in Hopi, we have what we call clans. So I belong to the tobacco clan. Our clan came from the south through what is now known as Winslow. There's a ruin there called Homolovi. We came to there to Hopi. So we all <clears throat> came to the oldest village that's still in existence, which is called Oraibi. Oraibi. That's where Hopi settled. Now, the interesting thing about this, as I mentioned, we traveled all over the U, uh, what currently is U.S., but into New Mexico, Central America. We went all over, and then we found a spiritual calling. So we all went to what is now Arizona and Oraibi and the Hopi Reservation. So the Hopi is probably the only tribe <clears throat> that was never re relocated. They chose where they want to be, even though there were obviously questions from the people, the Hopi people, like this is really dry. This is, you know, there's nothing out here basically, but why are we gonna stay here? It, it's, a, it's a challenge for the Hopi to then start practicing their religion. If we have faith in what we believe in, we will survive. So I mentioned before that we we, we call what we call dry farming. We don't irrigate. We just pray to our ceremonies. And our ceremonies are, are continuous. And we also have a calendar, which are the moons. We go by the moons, certain moons. And so right now, we refer uh, in, in non-Hopi, it's November. And right now it's Gilemuyao, which is a time for harvest. So we're harvesting. This year, unfortunately, our, our, um, our fields were very, very dry. And so I'm a farmer. I plant. I plant by hand. And then, of course, sometimes I, the modernization, I sometimes use a tractor for the bigger fields. But when we were planting by hand, it was this hard. So faith being what it is, we, we didn't give up. We still plant it with the hope that it will grow. And for me, none of my plants came up. But that is also a testament of our lifestyle, what's going on in the world. So we're not hoping just just living on Hopi, not worrying about everybody else. And in our songs, it, it's about that. We're praying for everybody in the universe. And so our lifestyle is such that this is a message for us that we need to change our lifestyle. And if we can do that, then things will come back, not to a normal normal, but at least we'll start to raise some more crops. So those are our beliefs. And we Hopi has prophecies. Those have already come true. As a young, young man, I listened to those in the Kiva, and um, you know, I'm at the age now where I'm finally understanding what all those things are, and I can't believe that they actually prophesized what was going to happen. So there's a lot of non-Hopis that are really studying that. Is how, how is it possible that you knew what was going to happen? Well, I can't explain it, but that the elders and the, the folks that had the highest initiation, they can. So this is our story. So our migration story is, is really something that we have to really treasure and, and also our survival. So if you've never been to Hopi, this is the Hopi Reservation. We're up in northeastern Arizona near the Four Corners area. So 
that's when that's what we're confined to right now because of the the federal government and all the in, involvement that they had with us so even though I say that we chose where we are now our reservation was actually a lot larger than that so over here you see Flagstaff that's the western boundary of the initial reservation even up even towards uh, Williams <clears throat> there's there was a Hopi name so that signifies that that's the outer boundary and then all the way up to Navajo Mountain yeah oh, oh I'm sorry <laughs> uh, okay um, so even so you see the the where we are now in the little Hopi Indian reservation then when you see the bigger, not circle, but the boundary, that was basically our initial reservation too because you have Hopi names where the dots are. And so what Hopi, how Hopi may, uh, identifies their, their land is they do shrines. There are shrines that are made by these priests and they deliver prayer feathers to those. So that's, even though <clears throat> we don't claim that now, we believe that's still ours, and that's part of the prophecy. And I, I can't tell you how that's going to come out, but that's part of our prophecy. So, that's, so we don't know really how that's going to work out. And again, this is another. So there's pictoglyphs all over. And when you go down to, uh, uh, I can't even think of his name. But anyway, he's down on the Potomac. He has all the information on the pictoglyphs because he's, He's the tour guide, so all the symbols on here he'll, he'll identify. And sometimes we, we hear about, uh, even down in Mexico, the Aztecs, Peruvians, they talk about uh, technology and being in contact with, I guess, the aliens, so to speak. When you see some of those pictoglyphs, you try to identify what they are, and sometimes you, you look at them, and in some of the pictoglyphs I've seen out on Hopi, they actually do look like aliens. I call them aliens, but they're from another world or another universe, and you can actually see almost like spaceships in those. So Hopi has this story that they've been all over, even into the other planets like the moon, the sun, and all that. They have stories about those. So it's very interesting to listen to those elders. So this is basically what we call the circle of life, but it's also a circle of our journey. So we ended up in basically a spot where we enjoy life, we, we love it and everything. And so in the beginning, we were, because we were nomadic and we didn't really settle down anywhere. Right away, we, we built um, what they were called pit houses because whatever, wherever they were, they would build a home, a house, and then if, depending on what was going on there or how the climate was and whatever, they started to move on. So around 700, 900 BC, their architecture started to change. So this really happened when they started to settle down permanently in what is now Hopi. So this is the, 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 the way they started building. So even Hopi had uh, condominiums and they started to build high rises, <laughs> right? So, so they were very, very uh, skillful in what they do. And some of these are still standing. And when you go out to Hopi, there are houses, and these are basically just sandstone and mud. And if they can stand time, why? And that's a good question. So people are amazed that these have stood for thousands of years. And, and down, and these are, are villages that have changed over time, and so they're, they're not going to look like this anymore. They're going to be a little bit more modern, so to speak, but not that much. 
This is at Walpi First Mesa. This almost still looks the same when you go up there, except maybe the the walls have been improved a little bit, but not. They didn't tear them down, tear them down or rebuild them. They they just put new mud on them and all that. Next to that. <clears throat> The people at First Mesa call this a limbo rock <laughs> because that's, a, that's, the, that's their plaza right there where those plaques are or the baskets are. And right behind that rock is a kiva. That's an underground chamber where, as I was mentioning, the dance groups will practice. So, so everything that we do in our ceremonial cycle is everything starts in January our ceremonial cycle, so, it's, so we believe, in, believe that everything has life, even the rocks. So everything starts underground. That's why we have underground chambers. So if you go out to Hopi in um, like February, that's when we have our Boamaya. People commonly call it a bean dance. So everything is done underground. I'll go over that a little bit later. And then this is just some of the landscape. This is more like probably uh, towards uh, Tuba City. This looks like coal mine, but that's just close. That's close to the Hopi Reservation. And this is just another example of how we survived for thousands of years. And so in. A lot of these villages started to be built around 900, 1070. That's when they were starting to, because people were starting to, huh? Okay. So, so the rest, as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> so, you know, you, you know when, so we were here long before Columbus was. So Columbus came 1492. And there's two other presentations. One is from by Ed Cabote. He go he talks about the Spanish that came, the Pueblo Revolt. We went through all that. We went to the um, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm sorry I'm going to rush this, but this is also the uh, one of the village areas. It's an aerial view. They, they still exist. They're still there after thousands of years. So this is how Christianity tried to come in and convert us to not practice our culture anymore, but we were very resistant that we weren't going to change. And so education was a big part of the push to assimilate us into what we call the white men's society. So the traditionalists, these are all traditionalists that resisted for the Hopi, and because these people resisted, they were all arrested and they were all sent to Alcatraz, and they spent about 10 years there in prison just to protect our culture, and they didn't want our kids to be going off to school. So those, and this is the beginning of, of education on Hopi Reservation. All the young kids are there, and the culture, so we, it goes down to our youth, and this is in an actual village in kind of like modern times, so to speak. And so this is a dance in the village. We have a, every village has a plaza that where we dance. And so we went, and as I mentioned, we, 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 we survived a lot of struggles, and we even went through uh, the drought when actually Hopis actually left the reservations, but because home was home, they all came back. So that's also with us. No matter where you live as a Hopi, Home is always on Hopi, because your heart never le leaves Hopi. Your soul is always there. So even though I, I worked here for about 10 years, I never really called this home. This was just a temporary place for me. I was always going to go home, so that's where I'm am, I'm, I am now. So we are also going to, um, and this is when we're very blessed, when we have a lot of rain. So, you know, kids enjoy it. This is our outdoor swimming pool. This is actually a plaza. <laughs> this is actually a plaza. But, it, you know, you can see it juice for everything, right? So these are just some old pictures of old villages that have been basically remodeled, and they're still standing. So what I wanted to do was um, show you a video that really talks about our corn. And this is a village in Munkapi. 
This is sort of like the, like the modernization of the village. It still exists and you know, it's thriving. So this is the only place that irrigates their farms because they're close to a, a reservoir. Okay, yeah. We're farmers because we were given that. What the Creator told us was that He gave us our destination, a place, so we could do everything over there from heart what we would need. That's when he gave us the planting stick and the seeds. In Hopi life, we are the children of the corn. We, we are the corn. The clans began to understand that the place that we settled in was going to be a hard place to survive in. We look around our Hopi villages and it is pretty much semi-desert. We don't have much rainfall, but this was where the Hopi clans were uh, told to go to. So this is our chosen place that we now live within. Together we carried out a way to survive here and to carry out this Hopi way of life way of life that we learned was to be hard, a way of life that was going to have corn and rain to be the most important things in our culture and our life. I think it's part of our faith that comes from our heart, you know, that uh, if we pray hard enough, we, we hope to have lots of snow, you know, and as you can see, some of the snow that's in my field here today, I'm real happy about that because I, I know that, you know, it's going to help me uh, when planting time comes. If you're going to be a farmer, you have to know what it means to be a farmer. You don't simply put seeds in the ground, is what he said to me. You have to put seeds in the ground with prayer. You have to do this realizing what you're about to do. You're about to start life and you are continuing on the cycle of Hopi. Never ever count your plants and number your plants like scientists do. You don't do that. They're not numbers, they're children. They're your children. So when you go to your field like that, you know, you're, you're, as you're from a distance to your field, you're singing a song and they see you and they see, they hear you. They say, Our dad's coming. Where? And then they tiptoe. And that's how they grow. Next stage, when we wisa. They're growing, we're growing tall because they hear your voice and they dance, come here, and they tiptoe. That's how they grow. When we wisa, okay? So you never look at your plant as numbers. They're your children. And the woman and the girls have a responsibility to be the caretakers of everything that the men bring in. And the, both the woman and the girls, including the men and boys, consider their corn and everything that they bring in to be their children too, so they take care of them. And I surely hope that you all can keep on uh, bringing in the corn to your home, because corn can never be faded away from a Hopi home. It always has to be there. It always has to be our main uh, food. There's, if we don't have corn in a home, we'll, we'll starve because the corn is the only thing that, you, that we survive on. When we were young little girls, I remember our mother would not let us lay around and not do anything, especially when our dad or our brothers would go to the fields, our uncles. Don't just sit around and do anything while the men are at work for us planting corn because we're going to all benefit from it. It's work and it's fun. It's like your family here. My grand, my dad, my mom, my grandmother, 
they're all right here in this we're called Hopis and this is that when you have this you're a Hopi you um, this this is you you little kids and us everybody is corn um, we all need food and water just like the corn here needs rain remember that our for hundreds of years the Hopi men have been doing this and growing this in this land where we live. It's not just happening today, it happened a long time, all during the history of the Hopi people. They have grown their own food and they have lived and survived out here in this, in this land just by planting the seeds that they came with and putting it into the ground. Hopi life is, is not easy. It was never meant to be easy, so a Hopi person should always remember that if it's worth doing and you're putting your hard work into it, do it with a good heart, enthusiasm, and willingness to, to do and accomplish as much as you can. It's like saying a small prayer each time, saying, you know, I want you to grow and I promise I will take care of you. And this is just the way Hopi lives with one another. We, we say our prayers daily, every day. We, we recognize and acknowledge the sun because that's where all our energy comes from. With the sunlight, everything grows even people. So we covered a thousand plus years in 30, 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of stories to tell. We have a long history, but I'm really, really happy that you joined us, could be with us this morning. I'll be presenting again this afternoon, and following me will be Rick Baker, who also will talk about our tradition running. But I'm glad you came, so kwa kwa, thank you. <laughs>